Good morning. It is May 28th, and today the lectionary reading takes us to Acts chapter 2, dealing with the day of Pentecost. And uh, Pentecost was a celebration in the life of, the, of God's people, and it was a harvest festival. Uh, so I know this sounds strange to many of us because we think of harvesting um, later in the year, but actually some things are harvested fairly early. And so that's part of what this was. It was a celebration of God's grace and mercy. And um, ver chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. So the emphasis here on unity is important to notice, friends. That God did something in their midst because they were praying and because they were unified. Suddenly, verse 2, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. So they didn't know what was happening, but there was some kind of auditory experience that happened. Verse 3, they saw, visual experience, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Now, what I think is interesting is many of us, when we read that, we skip over one of the important details. We notice little tongues of flames that came and rested on each of their heads. But we leave out a key word. Here in English, it is the word separated, right? So they saw a one flame that separated so one spirit, one a unity of God, a unity of humans together, and, and the spirit comes down and then separates and goes to each one of them. Verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the spirit enabled them. Now, this is a, a, a passage that's very popular and confusing and conflicting to many people. Um, it is commonly understood that this is uh, a, a charismatic experience of speaking in a heavenly language, the language of heaven itself. And uh, people uh, like to do that as an expression of their faith. Um, and this is not in any way a put down of people who do that. I don't think that's what this passage is about. Paul does talk about that kind of an experience in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and, and thereabouts. I don't think that's what's going on here, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I want Let's keep reading, and I'll point out a couple of things for you. First of all, it's important to notice who the crowd was because that's a key element to what's going on here. So verse 5, they, now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. You got that? Every nation. The focus here is on every nation under heaven. Um, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own, and then I'm reading out the New International Version, it says, own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of them, each of us, hears them speaking in our own native language? Now, the Greek words here is, in verse 4, um, they be, each of the disciples began to speak in other tongues is glossa, which is um, a word that has same root as the word that Paul uses uh, in 1 Corinthians, glossolalia in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12. However, in verse 6, it is not the word glossa. It is a completely different word. It is the word dialecto, which is obviously where we get our word dialect. So, um, verse 7, how is it that these men who are Galilean 
are speaking as we're uh, we're all hearing them in verse 8. How is it that each of us hears them in his own dialecto? Remember, there are people from all over the earth, every nation under heaven who are here. And then we have a list in verse 9. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the clear thing to notice here is this is not merely just a, a boring list. You know, there are there are some lists in the Bible, especially you get to numbers and other, and there's just these long lists, and you think, good grief, this is a long list. That's not what's going on here, friends. We're trying to establish two things. First of all, these are the some of the nations that are represented here, which means these are also the native languages that are being represented here. So you've got uh, Parthenians who hear a Galilean fisherman speaking Parthenian. And then you've got Medes, uh, Cappadocia, Pontus, Phrygia, Pamphylia. You've got Egyptians who are there who are hearing um, want these Galileans speaking Egyptian. How, how is that possible? Parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own glossa, not dialecto. So what I perceive in this passage of Scripture, we're not talking about other passages, in this passage of Scripture, glossa and dialecto are being used interchangeably. Um, this is, And this is clear from the context that this is not some kind of mysterious heavenly language. These are earthly languages. Now, friends, don't misunderstand what's going on here. This is a miracle. Um, I don't think Peter knew how to speak German, just to pick a modern language that we would understand. And yet, um, that something like that happens. So I've, ha I've had somebody ask me a question one time, Brother Ronnie, so um, what happened on the day of Pentecost was a miracle. Do you think it was a miracle of speaking or a miracle of hearing? And that's an interesting question. And the answer is, I have no idea. What the person is asking is, do you think that, let's just say Peter, Peter who knew no German, he was actually speaking German, which was a miracle. It was a miracle of speech. And then someone from Germany heard that and said, oh, I hear someone speaking in my language. How does that guy know my language? So that's a miracle of speech. Or was Peter speaking his own language, and yet someone from Germany Instead of hearing Hebrew or Aramaic or even Greek, they were hearing German. It was a, it was a miracle of hearing. And the answer is, I have no idea. It, to me, it's an interesting question, but it's unanswerable. The key part here is that each person heard in their own language. Uh, and then, um, verse 12, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? And that's a great question. Verse 13 some of them began to assume these guys were drunk. I mean, they're acting, this is weird. They knew something was going on. And then Peter stood up with the 11. I've gone past the lectionary reading for today. This is included in the lectionary reading for Sunday. Uh, that Peter stood up with the 11 and raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this, in other words, what you're seeing, what, what is happening, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he quotes Joel. In the last days... God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I'll show wonders from the heavens above. And, and then there's, there's other signs and wonders up in the heavens. 
And then uh, verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So there's a couple of things that are going on here, friends. This was not um, a momentary filling of the Spirit so that the disciples were suddenly filled with joy. Uh, that's something that I hear when people talk about uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our current experience today. Um, it's not that they received power just for the sake of power to be a stronger Christian. Um, they didn't learn a heavenly language so they could experience an ecstatic joy and an emotion and closeness with God that they never had before. That's none of that is what's going on here. This was a miraculous miracle of speech or hearing one way or the other whose ultimate purpose was that the gospel was declared in, er in the language of every nation on earth. People heard the gospel in their own native language, recognizing that this was a miracle. This was not a natural thing. So that's the first thing that's going on. It's for the declaration of the gospel. And, and I want to remind you what so many people just divorce chapter 2 and the theology of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They do somehow divorce that from Acts chapter 1. It's disconnected. Let's listen to what Jesus said about this. In Acts chapter 1, he said in verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Okay, and I know people today who, who talk about power, personal power, to make you a better Christian kind of power, power to deal with temptation, and all that's good. There's nothing wrong with that, and I believe God does do stuff like that in our lives. That's just not what Jesus is saying, because he tells us what kind of power he means. He says, and you will be my witnesses. It's power for witnessing. Jesus is talking about boldness, clarity of thought, the ability to miraculously, we now know, present the gospel in other languages. Friends, this is for witnesses. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And if you separate chapter 1 from chapter 2, then you completely missed part of the main point of what the day of Pentecost was about. It was about the declaration of the gospel. Remember, Jesus was the Savior of the whole world, but he didn't come to the whole world. He came as the Messiah to the Jewish people. He is the Savior of the whole world, don't get me wrong, but he only came, as he said, to the lost sheep of Israel. But if the Christian movement, if the gospel is to go beyond the walls of Israel, beyond the people of Israel, the race of Jews, well, how's that going to happen? It's going to happen through you, through God's followers. It's going to be spread person to person through the apostles and on through the work of the church. So this day of Pentecost, first and foremost, first of all, maybe not form, foremost, but first of all, it's about the spreading of the gospel to the nations beyond Israel. But the second thing that this is ultimately about is the inauguration of a new age. Something radically different happened in this event that has not happened in the history of the world before. And the prophet Joel prophesied that this very thing was going to happen. And I want you to notice in the prophecy of Joel, verse 17 again, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on, and then I underline that whole passage, I will pour out my spirit, and I, and I made one word stand out because it's the most important word. It's the word all. I will pour out my spirit on all people. And I know that's the emphasis because that is repeated a couple of times in different ways. So who does all include? Well, the next verse. All includes sons and daughters. All includes women too, not, not just men. Um, young men, it includes young, it includes old. Even on my servants, men and women. So sons, daughters, men's women, men and women, 
I will pour out my spirit. In other words, on all of these people. And notice that verse 4 also has the same word. They were in the house. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. And all, that's the word repeated through here, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. The speaking in tongues part, friends, in a way that's secondary to the bigger thing that happened here was the filling of the Spirit. Now, the reason this has not happened in the history of the world before this moment is because uh, God's Spirit did come on people in the Old Testament, but it was special people for a special purpose, often for a special task. And so... Uh, the Spirit would come upon Gideon, and God led him to win a great victory in battle. The Spirit would come upon a prophet, and the prophet would prophesy and speak, thus says the Lord. But the concept of the Spirit living in and dwelling in God's people, anybody, regardless of whether you're a prophet or not, whether you're a king or not, whether you're a warrior or not, whether you're male or female, none of that matters. If you know Jesus, you have the ability to experience the presence of the living God through the Holy Spirit living in you. Friends, that has never happened until this day, the day of Pentecost. That's why Jesus said, it is for your benefit that I leave. Remember, he told his disciples that on the night of the Last Supper, and they had no clue what he's talking about. What is he talking about leaving for? They heard the leaving part and didn't quite grasp hold of the benefit. It is for your benefit. And so, friends, you and I are somehow better off than if Jesus never left the earth. And I think part of that is because the Holy Jesus is one individual but now the Holy Spirit can be in everybody. All at once. Jesus came and went. He had supper, and then he's gone. He showed up in a closed room, uh, in the upper room, and then he was gone. But the Holy Spirit has come to be with the church and remain in people. Well, this is a, this is a powerful passage. And friends, uh, I just want to remind you uh, in closing that uh, in the book of Hebrews... See, I think Pentecost is, is at least part of where this is going. Um, in the book of Hebrews, you have chapter 11, which is the great uh, hall of fame of faith, right? Um, that, um, that these are people who trusted God in an extraordinary way. All these Old Testament people. But at the end, the last verses say these words. These were all commended for their faith. And yet, none of them, none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us they would be made perfect. And so this is part of what's going on here is the better we have something Old Testament people never had. Part of that is, is going to be the Spirit of God living and dwelling in us. And when the Spirit of God lives and dwells in you, um, and you experience a new birth, when you experience a deeper filling of the presence of the Holy Spirit, you are changed. You've, you've heard it uh, said, um, maybe you've heard this phrase, it doesn't, when the Spirit gets a hold of you, doesn't matter how high you jump, it matters how straight you walk when you land. Uh, it's not about emotions, although emotions are a part of our faith, and thank God for that. Uh, but it's not about emotions, it's about a faithful life. It's about holiness and being surrendered to the Lord. Thank God that I live in the New Testament days. I don't want to be an Old Testament person of faith. I want to live in the New Testament to have something that was promised, but not one single person ever got it. But you and I can. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much that 
the Apostle Paul says in Galatians that if we know you, then we have the Spirit living inside of us. And yet he says in Ephesians that we should continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's clear, Lord, there's there's something going on here with the Holy Spirit that we get the Holy Spirit when we get saved, when Christ comes to live and dwell in our hearts, but yet there are deeper surrenders. There are deeper experiences. And these are works of healing, works of holiness, works of surrender that happen in our lives, Lord, to help us be better, faithful, loving, grace-filled people of God that you're calling us to be. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the thank you for the power to be bold witnesses for Jesus. Even when our hands are sweaty, even when we are trembling a little bit, your word can go out of us. We can be your witnesses, Lord, and that's what we want. We want to honor you. And may the gospel continue to spread and may the church grow as the church lives as the church, the people that you've called and set apart to reveal Jesus to a hurting and dying world. For we pray this rejoicing in the name of our King. Amen and amen. Change my heart, O God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. Change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. the potter, I am the clay, hold me and make me, this is what I pray, change my heart, oh God, make it ever true, change my heart, oh Walk in the Spirit today. Be surrendered to Jesus. Amen.